Good evening and welcome. Let's say a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Direct, O Lord, we beseech thee all our actions by your holy inspirations, and carry them forward by your gracious assistance, that our every prayer and work may begin in you, and through you be happily completed. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's good to be together, to do what we can to engage with the wound in the heart of Christ that uh, has occurred through sexual abuse of children by priests. We're here to try to engage that as our Lord would with the love of the Sacred Heart. Uh, Mr. Richard Winman, Winman is a native of New Orleans, he suffered through Hurricane Katrina. He's a grandfather. Uh, he's a very skilled musician. And uh, he is a victim of sexual abuse by Boy Scout leaders, by a police officer, and by an employee of Catholic high school and by a Catholic priest. And he's bravely come to share with us what he's been through and his vision for how things can be. So without further ado, I present Mr. Richard. News in New Orleans, what they did is they did a really good job, they did a special on my story, and they were able to encapsulate 10 years of abuse, childhood sex abuse, into 10 minutes. And so I'd like to show you that video right now. Fox 8 has done extensive reporting on claims of church sex abuse this year. We learned Richard Winman, as a child, was repeatedly abused first by Boy Scout leaders then allegedly by an NOPD detective, a Jesuit high school janitor, and a priest. Kimberly Kurth has his story. I was uh, in front of my house with a bicycle ram. I wanted to be evil, couldn't evil, that was my thing. That's who I looked up to. Like other little boys growing up in the 70s, Richard Women had big dreams of being a famous stuntman like Evil Knievel. He had the dirty blonde Knievel hair. He was cute, sweet, a typical mid-city kid. While women practice his best Knievel feat in front of his house on Dimacourt Street near Jesuit High School, a Boy Scout troop leader stopped by to talk with his mom. I didn't know it then, but um, what they would do is go through the neighborhoods and identify single moms and ingratiate themselves and then take care of the kids. He's going to be in the Boy Scouts. Unbeknownst to women and his mother, that new Boy Scout troop was born for another reason, a dark reason. It was pedophiles coming in, starting a troop for the express purpose of having access to kids. Only eight years old, women's short time in the Boy Scouts would become violent. He says all four of his scout leaders, Raymond Woodall, Richard Stanley Halverson, Harry Kramer, and Louis Cialli, raped him. And more. And more. People would fly in from out of town. The men who parents trusted to take care of their young had formed an infamous pedophile ring, Boy Scout Troop 137. These people threatened my son, and right now he is crying over this scene. And I 
upset about it. Myself, I think they should be punished. Years passed before the troop was on police radar. It's almost sickening to think about it, you know. Mason Spong had no idea the case he worked in 1976 as a young detective would change his life. At one of the local drugstores, a man saw some sexually explicit pictures of young children, and he reported it. Spong, now an Orleans Parish DA investigator, says that tip led detectives to the ring, and their investigation would reveal men traveled to New Orleans to have sex with the boys, and the children were even taken across parish lines. They took these kids across the lake to k B Ranch, and they had sexual acts over in St. Tammany. And this went on for, for a while, you know, a couple years before we even came onto, the, onto these pictures that were turned over to us. As part of the case, Spong met a little boy named Ricky. Ricky told unimaginable stories of abuse. He was frail. Uh, just had a, his personality was twice as big as his body. You know, he was a good kid. That boy was Richard Winman. At some point, Ricky was able to speak to these other children, and he got them to trust us. You were able to corroborate everything that Richard Winman told you as a little boy. Everything. If convicted of all charges, Woodall could get up to 165 years in prison, and Ciale could get 60. Spong says women's brave testimony became critical to prosecute the scout leaders. It was kind of gut-wrenching because I've heard these different stories from these different children, and then to hear it again and to wa watch Ricky testify, he was pretty good. He brought all the facts forward. He was f looking at nothing but adults in the courtroom, all strangers, plus he had the press there. The aggressive, uh, cruel, crass nature of these violations is such that these little minds are going to be affected for a long, long time. Strongly worded written opinion, Judge Oliver Schulenkamp called Raymond Woodall's crime repulsive. And as the case progressed, the detectives involved kept watch of the young victims. But the investigator checking in on women was another assignment. So Winman was introduced to the lead detective of the NOPD's pedophile unit at the time. Stanley Burkhart. So he asked Stanley Burkhart to keep an eye on him, you know, because he was special to us. Even though women's rapists were in prison, he still wasn't safe. The Burkhart definitely knew the Boy Scouts, all of those guys. The cop who was supposed to protect children accused of putting a young woman through another haunting round of sexual abuse. In one case, I contact, contacted uh, two police officers one of them actually uh, actively uh, discouraged me from bringing it up. And the other one, um, the other one said, don't call back, hung up the phone. So, so who do you call, you know? As a kid, you don't know to call the attorney general or the state police or the FBI. Women says Burkhart even threatened him with a picture of a dead teen named Eddie when he refused to listen. Another one of Burkhardt's alleged victims told us the same thing. Stanley opened up uh, one of the drawers of his desk and showed me the picture of what I now believe is Addy. Uh, couldn't remember the name at that time, but I believe it. There was crime scene photos of a decomposing body. Vic V.J. Groomer says he first met Burkhardt in the 70s when the former sex crimes detective moved into the Bayou St. John apartment complex that his parents managed. Groomer says he and Burkhardt's nephews would play together. That would get me in his apartment. He'd have his nephews there, so it was kind of okay to go run in uh, to the apartment. And uh, then eventually his nephews wouldn't be there. That's when Groomer says the rapes began. He was just eight years old. You know, he would point what I, you know, guns at you and click, click, you know, and pull the trigger. He'd point the gun at himself, put the gun to his head. Groomer only recently told his family what happened to him as a little boy. But then to see uh, Richard Winman's story and to see him, you know, see his picture and to see another human being that was, uh, that was molested by the same guy, it just was... It, it really set, 
It set a lot in motion. And as reported in this 1982 Times-Picayune article, the body of Edward Wells was found floating in the Mississippi River. The coroner believed the six-year-old drowned, but Burkhart, the detective on the case, told the reporter he was convinced Wells was murdered. When Groomer saw this picture of Wells, he knew he had seen him before. Holy, holy shit, that's him. That's him. Very much. Uh, just, just he was, you know, he was staring at me, and I had seen him alive. I knew, I knew the face. The NOPD says they are now taking a new look at Wells's death. You know, looking back at it, he's, he, he's an animal. He's, a, he's, he's a monster. It's the best I can say for him. Burkhart was convicted of numerous sex crimes in the 1980s and 90s, but was never prosecuted for women's allegations. Court documents, though, show women was called as a witness in a 2011 federal case against Burkhart. The court concluded then Burkhart was a sexually dangerous person, and in coming to that ruling, the judge cited significant events in Burkhart's life, including that while a police officer, he molested Richard Women, a young boy at the time. The opinion also says the court finds clear and convincing evidence that the testimony of Mr. Women is credible, and the denial by Mr. Burkhart of this incident is not credible. It was almost more gut-wrenching to hear that one of our own abused Ricky. It, it, it was, to me, it was worse than the initial blow when we first started investigating this case, that one of our guys violated this child. It was tough. Burkhardt served time in federal prison, but got out in March of 2015. The NOPD confirms it's now investigating a sexual assault allegation against Burkhart from the 70s. Women says he is the victim in that case. He just doesn't need to be out in the streets. Uh, he's a dangerous, dangerous person. When Women shared his story with us in a TV exclusive earlier this year, he also told us about even more sexual abuse. And Burkhart also knew the Jesuit. You know, I played basketball in the back of Jesuit and uh, and there was Burkhart and Peter Modica on the sidelines. So they knew each other. Women, 12 years old at the time, wasn't a Jesuit high school student, but he says school janitor Peter Modica brought him on campus often. One day, Modica started raping him and then priest and theology teacher Cornelius Carr walked in. Then I thought it was over. It's a priest. It's a priest. He's a janitor. It, I can't tell you the, I thought it was over and man, it just, when he walked over to me while Pete Monaco was sodomizing me and put his hand on my back and started masturbating, telling me to relax, I was just destroyed. I was destroyed. Women says the abuse finally stopped once he was older and he didn't believe Modica's threats anymore. He said, I'll murder your mom. Oh, he also said he'd murder me too, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. Said he'd murder your mother. Mm -hmm. Women came forward in 2012 about the sexual abuse at Jesuit High. The catalyst? Yeah. The Penn State sex abuse scandal. After hearing that news, women emailed then Jesuit High President Father Raymond Fitzgerald. I didn't go for money. I went for counseling and spiritual guidance. And they're like, nah, gee, here's a whole bunch of money. Shut up, go away. Jesuit High School eventually paid women nearly half a million dollars in a confidential settlement. Jesuits come out and said that the confidentiality clause on those settlements is that the request and only done if the victim. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your response to that? Never asked for it. A confidentiality clause um, in that particular scenario, only serves to protect them, not me. You know, I would never ask for such a thing because I would never put a ball gag in my mouth. Women decided to go public with his story this year, and we were the only television station to interview him at his home near Fort Worth, Texas. He wanted to speak out to protect other children. And in this current climate and environment, we need to demand more of the church until they 
absolutely come clean. We just drink the Kool-Aid and go along with it. Now's the time to say no. Both the Archdiocese of New Orleans and the Jesuits U.S. Central and Southern Province recently released lists of clergy members credibly accused of child sex abuse. Cornelius Carr, the priest who women says abused him, was on both lists. So we can't trust just the list to be an investigation. We also learned priest Cornelius Carr was housed at Fordham University in New York after women's alleged abuse. According to the university, the now deceased Carr lived at a Jesuit nursing home near the school's campus. In a statement to Fox 8, the university said it was not aware of the allegations against Carr until a report in the school's student newspaper. The spokesperson said Fordham believes Mr. Women is telling the truth about what happened to him, and it is heartbreaking. We hope he finds justice and healing. Yeah, so in a nutshell, that's my story. Um, so the abuse started when I was seven years old. It was when I was 17 years old. Um, at 19, um, I tried to commit suicide. Um, it was, um, that's a long story, too, but it was, okay. it was a miracle that I lived. Uh, I basically was in the house for like in a coma five days. Uh, I woke up intubated, catheter, charcoal all over my body. When you wake up like that, panic, panic, because I'm restrained as well. And the nurse comes over and puts something in the IV, and I go back to sleep. And when I wake up, all of that stuff is gone out. And, uh, another miracle is uh, my life magically got better. Magically got better. Um, I made myself very, very busy. I threw myself into my academic studies. After that, I threw myself into being busy with family. Um, busy with my career, and uh, I didn't have a rest. I made a conscious decision to put it on the back or, or just get over that thought. That's in the past. Um, when you see stories about Sandusky, and that was the catalyst for me, uh, we see it all the time. We see pedophiles being arrested, teachers, coaches, priests. Uh, the creepy old guy that pinned the arcade. You know, it just it triggers a victim of survival, um, and it uh, it's never ending. What did it What did it for me for uh, Jerry Sandusky? Uh, the media did. The, in my opinion, they gave too much detail, physical detail about the uh, about the, uh, the abuse, uh, the abuse and, and that just it set me off. It set me off, and. Uh, I went to the Jesuits, confronted them, and I went for spiritual guidance and counseling. And like I said in the video, there's a whole bunch of money, shut up. When I signed the agreement, I saw the confidentiality clause. I did sign the agreement, but I didn't feel it was enforceable because they were covering up a felony. And what's the church gonna do? Are they gonna, are they gonna you know, sue a, a victim of child and sex abuse? Because I'll be opposed to boy for that story too, right? And so when I signed it, I had no intention of keeping it a secret. But it took me a couple of years to, uh, to deal with that. Uh, it was a process coming forward. Um, I, I went to my church, believe it or not, I'm still practicing that. Um, I'm, a, I'm a member of the Knights of Columbus on the fourth degree night. And, uh, they found out, they found out uh, that I had signed the agreement in the Wallings 535 miles away. An order and diocese. So it, it occurred to me that they broke their own confidentiality agreement. And they harassed me. They coerced me. They threatened me. And that was my, excuse my French, fuck it moment. And I even recorded I have recorded on my negotiations with the Jesuits. And I had a copy of the agreement. It was irrefutable. And I leaked it to the press. And that's when things really exploded. Um, speaking of suicides, one of my childhood friends was on. Uh, he was molested by the same, same man. His sister walked in. His sister walked in and saw it. 
broke it up, but she didn't say anything. And when I went public with my story, she committed suicide. Oh. She was living with that guilt all the way. So that's, um, it tore me up. Uh, you know, and this is you know, how a, a victim matriculates through life. Uh, eventually they got to go for them. Um, uh, they have guilt, shame, fear that they're not going to believe. They think it's their fault. So they feel like they don't have any support. And so they escape. And what they do is they self-medicate with alcohol, drugs. And um, I mean, the drugs never really stuck. But alcohol. Alcohol wasn't my problem. Alcohol was my solution. And it took a toll. My battle life. Still do, actually. Um, and when that doesn't work, it eventually doesn't work anymore, as we've seen in those two cases, suicide. And in, in mass, if it's, not, if it's not dealt with, it will be suicide. A good friend of mine, last year, a guy, Nate Winston, promising him that he actually gets some advocacy work. For whatever reason, I guess he wasn't getting the support that he needed, and he killed himself last year. So I can get a little short talk about that. So, that's the life of a, a victim. It's horrifying. And what's worse is the only thing you can try to do is successfully manage it. That's the only thing you can do. We will have this for the rest of our life. Another thing to consider. When you do that to a child, you murder them, basically, you murder them. And you also murder their family. Um, it's the gift that keeps on giving. You know, my father never looked him in the eye again. Stop coming around. My mom went into a deep, deep depression. She never recovered from it. I was on my own. I had to grow up really, really fast. And um, it was a horrifying experience. Let me show you some bad guys. This is Monsignor Lawrence Hepper. Bad, bad guy. Um, several civil cases against him. Um, the Archbishop was supposed to uh, uh, be deposed and he was finally forced to. Uh, the Archdiocese of New Orleans uh, declared bankruptcy. And that was horrifying. Um, because all of those cases, all of them in the Wallings under the Archdiocese, over 50 of them, all those depositions, all that body of knowledge, evidence, was moved to federal court. In his deposition, which was sealed by the federal court, he admitted to raping children, taking them out of state, too. And the federal judge sealed the deposition, and he's not being prosecuted. And the church is paying his salary, his housing. And he's on the street, which disturbs me because what we know about pedophiles is the rate of recidivism is very, very high. They do not stop. Uh, they they will reoffend. And and uh, you know, uh, I, I just feel for the children in the walls. It's horrifying what we're going George Brignac is the most prolific. Serial child rapist in the history of the state of Louisiana. Um, there's a man named John Anderson, and uh, the organization I'm going to talk about. John Anderson is the vice president of men's support uh, programs, and he was molested by George Britnack. Uh, he reported it. He reported it, and he was arrested. And uh, when he went to trial, the courtroom was stacked. The Archbishop walked in, went to the judge's chamber, came out, case dismissed. And he would go on up. 
in the last more than 30 decades. Just recently, some years ago, um, they convened a grand jury based on a new victim. And well, they indicted him. And before he can get to trial, he falls down, breaks his back, dies. Justice in Attica. In his last will and testament, he said that his only regret, only regret, this is painful, his only regret is that he didn't do a better job of, of demonstrating to the children why he needed to share himself with them. No justice there either. Brian Sanders, a diocesan priest in Belchase, Louisiana, takes two kids to Mississippi, rapes them. Uh, investigation, no charges filed. But the, uh, the archdiocese, not me, the archdiocese said he was credibly accused, put him on the list. They laicized him. They laicized him way before he was put on the list. He goes to law school, comes in a train, opens up his own practice, and instead of practicing the entire spectrum of family law, he specializes in child custody cases. He gets arrested, he gets arrested for heroin possession, and I guess he got put up with some uh, drug diversion program for professionals. And when I found out about him, I complained to Louisiana State Bar, uh, and one of his clients simultaneously uh, complained. It turns out he lied on his state bar examination about the church, and he was waiting for his habit all his clients' trust accounts. And he's left town, he's barred permanently forever. He's working for a trucking company in Tennessee. No justice, still on the street. Lawrence Hacker, in a deposition, he admitted not on the list. Oops. Well, we know what happened to Brignac. Brignac was on the list. Hey, you want to know something fascinating about George Brignac? George Brignac, the, Ar the Archdiocese paid out a settlement to a victim for $500,000 and he still kept him in ministry for years. Finally, they were pressured to get him out, and then he goes uh, to the Knights of Columbus, and he becomes a knight, and he's running the Columbian Swire program for kids. Talk a little bit about, about the organization. Um, so, I worked for another organization for a while as a, as a volunteer, and uh, just doing you know, work in there, I saw some ways that we could improve uh, that weren't implemented. Things got kind of weird, but they're a good organization, and they, they do good work. And so we just decided to start our own organization, and uh, we do things kind of differently. Um, it's not a co environment. We have men's groups. Women's groups. It was my experience running uh, support groups for the other organization uh, that when you get men and women in the same room, don't share that level of detail about what happened. And so that's something that we did. Uh, we don't do monthly meetings, we do weekly meetings. For a monthly meeting, if I missed that one month, I go two months without support. So we do frequent, massive engagement. Um, and there's some people I'll tell you about. First off, let's meet but today when I have a bad hair guy day. And this man, and I say the names, you're okay with it, Joe Ellis, he came to us about three months ago and he got hooked into the support group. Um, we gave him some referrals. He's an active member. When he came to us, he couldn't say two words without crying. And now he's living his best life. That's how quickly he turned around. Gilbert Gall, the first 
a pedophile priest I was convicted in Louisiana. Well, that's this gentleman. His name is uh, Billy Joe McMillan. And that guy is suffering, but he's doing better. This is the whistleblower priest, Rizar Birna. And uh, he, not only was he a whistleblower and responsible for a bishop alone to resign, but he was also a uh, seminary. And this guy hadn't received communion in 34 years. The church wouldn't take him at that. So Rizard flies out from Buffalo, me from Texas, this guy from New Orleans, do a service, we gave him communion. He's doing better now. Uh, so uh, we were on a tight ship. We have a new, we have about a thousand members. Um, we run out on a shoestring. And we kind of like it that way. I don't like asking for money. So we run the entire global organization for 180 bucks a month. And we have members in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Canada, UK, Mexico, Brazil. So now we're growing pretty quick, especially considering we've only been in business since February 11th. And, uh, the way ahead, I promised, was get support and then get people will tell you, yeah, go, come forward. Uh, it's going to make, make things better. Well, it is. But your life's going to be a little bit different. And it's not a one size fits all solution. You may do it the next day, it might take you a couple of years. But you need support. If you need support, you can come to us. You can be anonymous if you want and get the same level of support. And, uh, I got a surprise for you. Uh, Josh Jenkins from the Attorney General's Office of Virginia is with us tonight. And he's gonna come up right now and tell us what victims can do to be justice. Thank you. I am Josh Jenkins, and thank you, Richard. I think it's incredible to hear stories of survivors and warriors who are doing the work and have lived through um, the kind of abuse that you did. Um, I work for Attorney General Mark Herring. I'm an assistant attorney general for the state of Virginia. Attorney General Herring um, has launched an investigation and prosecutions uh, of uh, clergy members for sexual abuse committed within the state. Um, we have two active cases being prosecuted right now, but I know that there are dozens and dozens of cases of abuse that could be prosecuted uh, if and when there is a survivor willing to come forward and talk to us. And so uh, Attorney General Herring uh, did establish a hotline number uh, that people can call. Really, maybe the easiest way to find it is to just Google Clergy Hotline uh, Virginia, and it'll come right up, but the number is 833-454-9064. That's 833-454-9064. And what I could promise to anyone who has been a victim of a sexual assault crime in Virginia is that if you work with me and you work with our office, I don't know that every case will be one we can prosecute, but I do know that every single survivor will be treated with respect and will be believed when they interface with me and interface with our office. So I really appreciate you giving us the chance to, to say this and to, and to be here, and I appreciate hearing uh, from you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here, Josh. And thank you, Richard, for uh, your presentation. I think Richard will want everybody to know that the name of the organization is the Survivors of Childhood Sexual Abuse, which is SCSA. And he's got a, a website, and he welcomes the membership of supporters as well as survivors. Uh, okay, well, we're, we're just gonna take a brief break. You'll note that in the chairs, there are note cards with pens <coughs> for questions uh, for Richard or myself, or I guess for Josh if he's willing to answer any, I imagine it is. So if you have a question, go ahead and write it down. We're going to pass a little basket just to, if anybody has anything spare, they want to support this series of speak, speaking engagements that we're doing. 
uh, Richard is the second in the series. He spoke yesterday in Martinsville, Virginia. Last month we had a, a survivor came from Missouri and spoke in Martinsville and in Roanoke. And then September we'll have the last of this first part of the series, which will be in Northern Virginia. Becky Yanni will speak at St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Alexandria. Uh, so if you want to get, offer anything to support the series, please do. We'll just take a moment. If you have a question, write it down. I'll collect the cards and uh, we'll handle the questions. Right out. Maybe could I just ask you kind yeah, of. Yeah, we're such a small group. Yeah, you know, just let's. I, I'm kind of confused, sir, about the in the story the pedophile cop, right? The the head of the of the pedo, of, of the anti pedophile. The commander of the pedophile unit of the Wall Street. himself a pedophile, yeah. right? I was a little bit confused in the story. It sounded like there was a boy who was they thought drowned. The pedophile said that he was murdered. It, it's uh, that uh, why would first, he? First off, Stanley Burkhart was abusing Andy Wells, and he was a he was investigating his own victim being murdered. And also, I'll say this: when I said it in court, I said it again. I said it on the documentary. Stanley Burkhart admitted to me. Andy Wells. I, I can't hear you without the mic. Yeah. What was that last sentence? Yeah, turn it off. Turn it off. Turn it off first. Oh. There we go. So it's coming broke right. How's that? Okay. So Stanley Burkhart um, was molesting Eddie Wells. Um, and um, Stanley Burkhart <laughs> was investigating the murder of his own victim. Stanley Burkhart admitted to me that he murdered Eddie Wells. Right now, Stanley Burkhart is in Butler, North Carolina. He has not been come. And so he was, what year, but they caught him and he got prosecuted. Do you know what year that was? Multiple years. He, he re-offended and was reconvicted three wow. times. Okay. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> I don't know the exact years. All right, okay. Uh, I'm just saying because in the story, it's mm -hmm. like they bring it up with your story, but the people of New Orleans, you know, they should have been awfully, you know, concerned about him long before, right? And so that's just mm -hmm. what I'm trying to figure out is how, how they were breaking news in that thing that we saw about that guy. That was already mm -hmm. known, right? They were maybe showing the connection to you. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, uh, so I'll tell you more about Stanley Burkhart. Um, when he was finished with me, he would put me out um, in the French Quarter on St. Peter Street. I'm not St. Peter, uh, St. Philip Street on a mailbox because that's what pedophiles patrol. And he would use me as bait uh, to make cases against pedophiles. He's an evil, evil man. Um, after, I didn't, after he didn't scare me about Eddie Wells anymore, and I told him I was done, I'm not doing anymore. He went to my house and he got a silk over all the pretty And he told me that he would be finished with me when I said he was. And there was no way, there was no way to stop that. Um, he was arrested like two weeks later and it was like, no And after he got out the first time, um, I guess he dealt with a friend and stayed in contact. And I thought I'd keep an eye on him. Um, it was a second offense. Um, he told me that uh, there was a boy in the neighborhood, and uh, and he was going to mentor him and bring him to the air show and all that stuff. And I called his probation officer and the police. The rest of the second man they raided his house to find the boy in the closet. Boy in the closet. Um, I forget the details of the third one that we offended again. Uh, I found out back when the story was done. Uh, he was out for a fourth time. I actually went to Butner and testified in a civil commitment hearing, uh, and they put him in jail for the rest of his life based on what you saw in the video. Another judge comes in and releases him back into the community. And that's really going to set me off. I contacted the state police. Uh, uh, he had supervised the release, uh, the returns to it, and uh, I talked to a, a state police detective 
the trolls and I know this guy better than anybody. I know what he's thinking before he even thinks it. If he's been out for 30 days, he has pornography in his house, child pornography, and he's gonna hide him in the album, sleeves of or an album connection. And it's gonna be on his phone too. And um, they found out the pedophile is a little sticker on the uh, on his driver's license <coughs> uh, for pedophiles, so you can identify him. And he took that designation off his license, got a job at Paris Casino, and that was a violation of his supervised release. And on that basis, they were able to raid his house and find porn. And, um, and then um, going to court again, uh, recently the judge ruled that the documentary that, uh, that I did on, on uh, is admissible. So he's not getting out. No. Thank you. You're welcome. Here's another question for you, Richard. If, do you think that <coughs> in the Knights of Columbus, with the Knights of Columbus being infiltrated by, by the child abusers? Um, I, I suspect, highly select, suspect, um, when I, when I went public at the Knights of Columbus meeting, they tried to make me go through safe and sacred, sacred training. They call it virtuous training up there, up here, I think. And um, I told them I wasn't going to do it. I told them in a meeting because, you know, um, about perpetrators are, are in a position to teach me how to not be a pedophile. And that caused some stir. And my grand knight uh, invited me to a steak dinner the next day. And caution you to be careful with people's reputations because he himself well, had an accusation made against him and uh, he was reassigned to an inner city school. And I'm like, oh, so that's who you are. Right? And so, uh, it's certainly possible. You know, they have a Columbia Squires uh, segment on Knights of Columbus. It's a lot like Boy Scouts, but with the Catholics twist. Yeah. It's possible, but I don't know. When your story was released to the press, that when this story originally came out, what kind of reaction did, did you experience to it? I got more support than I thought I would. Um, I had detractors, and um, but mostly support. Um, for a period of time, it, it was on the news. Um, when I first went public, it, it was the first time in recent times anybody did, and it opened up the floodgates on survivors and victims to come forward. Uh, at just the Jesuit High School, just about every boy in my neighborhood was um, was molested and raped by Cornelius this car and Pete Loke at Jesuit High School. Uh, I knew that there may be one or two, but it, it, was, it was, yeah. And people, people can be cruel. Somebody said in the comment section that, Hey, for four hundred fifty thousand dollars, I'll take it up the ass too. So I got the. Uh, oh, last night we got a question. Is it okay? Show that one. Please, please. Yeah. So one of the questions last night was, after you got molested the first time, why didn't you learn your lesson? Oh. No. No. So it's. But but I got support. I have a really strong, beautiful, loving wife. Uh, she was my rock. Uh, I never felt so completely loved in my life. It's, it's a love story for the ages. I wouldn't be here without her. Um, some of my stories before in public, he supports me, my daughter supports me. Um, and, you know, I have extended family, working with the other organization, and. Um, and so, yeah, it's been great. And you know, doing the organizational work, both the organization of mine, is cathartic, and uh, it, it helps you get through the day. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Richard. Well, we support you. Thank you. We thank you very much for being with us. So, Good the curves. Father, can I ask one more question? Can you talk about the Louisiana? Uh, statute of limitations and your organization. Yeah, so something else that we do is it'll um, kind of buttress with what Josh was talking about. Yeah, so um, we do advocacy work as well. Um, 
we got started working with a legislator, a legislator in, in Louisiana, and we went in asking, the original bill was, we wanted to extend the statute of limitations from seven years to 35 years. And so we mobilized, we testified in House committees, uh, we assembled victims and survivors, and their testimony was so compelling and so incredibly horrible um, that unanimously they completely eliminated the statute of limitations with a three year old back like that. And so we're very, very happy about that because victims like Avenue are vector for justice. So. Congratulations on the council. Thank you. Let's close with a glory be. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to your Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is, is now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Bob.